with us. Today we have with us Lisa Van Damme. Lisa has been with us in the past. You probably know her from Van Damme Academy or from the Read With Me app. And last week we discussed the aftermath, let's say, of the Leonard Pickoff lecture. And because we know that you like Lisa so much, uh, we thought we'd do another episode. Today, the episode has a very particular character. It's Q&A on parenting. So we have a lot of questions from our members. I also encourage you, the viewers, to ask questions via Super Chat. So when the Super Chat questions start coming in, we're going to go one question from the member, one question from Super Chat. So before we start, Lisa, do you want to tell us a bit about your parenting experience, so to speak, in a very few lines, and then we jump with the questions? Sure. Um, so somebody, I was looking through some of the questions that had been submitted and one of the questions was asking me to connect the philosophy of positive parenting with objectivist parenting philosophy. And so I thought I'd start this whole conversation by making a disclaimer and talking about what expertise I do have to offer to the extent I have any. Um, I don't think of myself as having a conceptualized parenting philosophy. It's not something I do a ton of reading about. It's not something that I have in any sort of really formalized set of principles. And I certainly don't consider myself as any kind of spokesperson for a particular parenting philosophy or specifically for objectivist parenting philosophy. I'm not even sure exactly what that would mean. So um, to, to the extent that I have something to offer on this subject, because I do get asked for advice a lot. And I think the way this came to be was that last week uh, when we went over to Clubhouse, someone asked specifically if I would do a Q&A on parenting. So what I have to offer, I think, is a generally good head on my shoulders, um, a lot of experience, because I have four children of my own, ranging from 22 to six, and also run a school where I've interacted with parents very closely, because it's a small school where I have intimate relationships with the, with the, um, the families there. So uh, for 25 years now, I've been interacting with parents over the, the challenges and struggles they have with their own children. And I have somewhat of a track record of success, I would say. I think my four kids are pretty awesome. <laughs> and, um, but I honestly think one of the main reasons people come to me for parenting advice is that they see what a profound enjoyment I take from parenting. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with is how to feel like they're being responsible and informative guides to their children and helping them to develop the kind of character and, and uh, skills they want them to have, while at the same time, really deriving a lot of enjoyment from the experience themselves, at least I hope that's their goal. So anyway, I just wanted to give that disclaimer if anyone wants to you know, walk quietly out of the back of the room because this wasn't what they signed up for. <laughs> I won't be offended by that. <laughs> if you see the notifications in my WhatsApp on how many questions we have, be sure that this is not what people are going to do. Okay. So in a way, you already mentioned the first question, which is what's the relationship between a positive parenting? So do you want to tell us what positive parenting is and no, what I its relationship I don't know much about positive parenting at all, so I'm not going to speak to that question. I know it's a philosophy of parenting that a lot of um, objectivists subscribe to, but I'm definitely not the person to answer that question. Okay, then let's proceed to question to the second question. I have them in random order, but you'll see there are some themes. So, should you push your child to achieve their potential, even if they don't want to? And mm -hmm. I attached a related question because there are so many, I have some of them have to be in purse. How can you encourage your kids to be ambitious from a young age? And how would you detect if it's overwhelming for them? So how does the child achieve their potential? How do you push your children to be ambitious, but without overwhelming them. Okay. So I've, I'm gonna feel compelled to start every answer with, in my experience. I think there's a hazard in overgeneralizing from your own experience to everybody's. And um, so I'll try not to do that every time, but I do want to make it very clear that I'm speaking from my experience. There's such a diverse range of child, you know, children's personalities and life situations. And, but I do 
want to say specifically in regard to that question that I am allergic to pushing. I don't even, I don't know what it means. I believe in creating an environment in which your child can develop things within which they'd want to push themselves. But I think the pushing has to come internally from them. I don't, at any time I've seen a relationship between a parent and child where the parent has a certain outcome that they're looking for and they're standing over their child with a certain expectation and a certain set of demands and a desire that they have this internal drive in themselves that the parents aren't seeing, that just ends up being an unhealthy relationship between the parent and the child. So just quickly from my own experience, I think the first time I learned this lesson was when my 22 year old was in ballet and I took her to ballet and I would watch her through the window and they would ask her to you know, do these arm motions and she would sit there with her arms like this and she would yawn and she would look miserable. And I tried encouraging her and bribing her with donuts after that, that was my methodology in the early days. And uh, I felt at the time like, well, I just need somehow to get her to get, <laughs> to learn that she has to kind of commit to things and push through things. And I went through this for about three or four weeks. And then at one point I went, the kid just doesn't like ballet. What am I doing? <laughs> she doesn't like it. Get her out of that class. And she ended up developing a passion for horseback riding, which she took very seriously and was really ambitious about and um, dedicated herself to. And then currently I have my six-year-old Coco who developed a passion for gymnastics at school from her friends. She noticed that they were tumbling. She started copying them. And she is absol absolutely obsessed with gymnastics and wants to you know, level up at every opportunity, wants to take private lessons, spends all day at gymnastics camp, and then wants to go to class afterwards. But it came entirely from her. So I view myself as more of a, a facilitator than a pusher. Um, I watch them carefully. I see what motivates them. I see, I observe what, makes them excited and makes them feel driven. And then I try to make sure that they have opportunities to excel in those areas. Excellent. Uh, Raz informs me that we're going to have a follow-up episode because of the demand for answers to parenting questions. So I'm never going to ask two questions at the same time. So apologies to the first people who submitted and asked your two questions at the same time. So what is the best way to teach a toddler that doesn't yet speak, that violence is not okay when he reacts violently because he didn't get his way? Okay, the first thing I would say about that is that you should treat a child like they can speak long before they can. So even from infancy, talk to them as if they can speak and assume they understand a lot more than, than you think they might. So with a toddler, often their, their capacity to understand language is far greater than their capacity to express themselves in language. And I think acting on that assumption is really important because you'll never know at what level they are um, because they can't communicate that to you directly. So even though it might seem because they can't express themselves in words, that explaining something to them isn't going to be effective, never assume that explanation is not effective. Always, I would always give them explanations. Um, you're building their capacity for language in the process and you're not making assumptions about what they can and can't understand. So along with that, I'm now expressing themselves violently could take on many different forms. Obviously, if they're going to harm someone, you have to physically remove them from, if there's a you know younger sibling that's going to be in harm's way, you have to physically remove them from the situation. But my approach generally with discipline is, is explanation always. So I would take, remove the child from that scenario, sit with them, try to get their attention, try to patiently wait until they're able to give me their attention and they're not in the grips of their own emotions and then explain why that's not acceptable. Um, and the only other thing I'll add in there is that 
you know, we all know that it's a cliche that kids act out for attention. Um, so I would offer, you know, calm, patient explanations for things, remove them from a situation if that's necessary, and then also um, don't give them a lot of don't react in a way that might be satisfying to them because they're looking for attention. So don't make them the center of attention because they're acting out in that way. Give them that explanation and then try to not reward that behavior with attention. So since we're moving to questions related to objectivism, don't sanction their tantrums, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have a super chat from Robert. Thank you, Robert, who says, invaluable insights. Thank you, Robert. So questions now. Uh, what did you learn from Leonard Peikoff about parenting? And can you tell us something about the curriculum that he created for the homeschooled? And I think you had something to do with this. Okay, so I, I saw the question about uh, Leonard Peikoff and parenting in advance of this discussion. And I was sort of turning it over in my mind because I have a you know decades long relationship with, with Leonard Peikoff. I taught his daughter, from uh, the when she she was from the ages of about eleven to fourteen and maintained a close relationship with them after that. So you would think that I would have in my subconscious a lot of discussions or advice from Leonard Peikoff on parenting, and I could come up with almost nothing. It seems like it's a topic we didn't really talk about, but I did think so. I'm, I'm going to answer this question in two ways: one with an anecdote that's especially touching and meaningful to me. And the other by saying, in a sense, Leonard Peikoff taught me nothing and everything about parenting. So I'll get to the everything in just a minute. The anecdote is that when I was teaching uh, Leonard's daughter and a few other children, after a couple of years of doing that, I went through a bit of a career crisis. I started to feel like it wasn't what I wanted to do. In retrospect, I know that that had to do with kind of personal issues going on at the time. And I was unable to sort those out from my dissatisfaction with my career at that time. But I was going through a career crisis, reconsidering whether I wanted to be in education and trying to figure out what my next step would be because I went straight from college into this homeschooling teaching situation. So I had no idea what else I might do. And I talked to a lot of people at that time, asking them for advice career advice about how I should try to even begin to tackle this question. And the advice I got came from a lot of different angles. Uh, it was a very wide range of, of uh, kind of premises behind the advice. And one person, for example, told me, well, you want to sit down and figure out what is an area in which you really want to change the world. And then that is the, that's the direction you should choose in terms of, in terms of your career. That was absolutely crippling and paralyzing to me because, and you know, thinking about it now, I think if I had no idea what <clears throat> sort of career direction I wanted to take and little experience uh, educationally or in practice with different jobs, how on earth am I going to know where I wanna change the world and, and whether I might, uh, whether it's even possible that I could do that. So that was a, that was a dead end. That was a non-starter for me. Then I had dinner with Leonard Peikoff who very kindly, though it meant I'm maybe leaving education, <laughs> uh, patiently discussed this topic with me. And his two pieces of advice that really stuck with me were first, um, what reflect on what you enjoyed about your day. Just you know, right, think, about, think about the last week. What were the things that brought you the most happiness um, in any, any part of your life? And note those down. And then think, can those take you in any, any sort of career direction. So we talked about that a little bit. And at the conclusion of that conversation, he said, well, it sounds to me like maybe you wanna be a mother. And he, he, he seemed to be aware that I might not be considering that a career, that it would be possible that what I really want to do and spend my time, do, my, my daily time and my thought and de, you know, devoting my hours to was actually parenting. So you know, in the culture that I was brought up with, it was sort of uh, you know, women's liberation and I, I needed to you know, go out and get a real job 
not just and farm out the parenting part. So that was that was very eye opening to me and actually has had a big impact on my career path, believe it or not, even though I am a working mom, um, because I'm a working mom who, you know, despite having been asked millions of times, when am I going to start another school? When am I going to expand? When am I going to formalize my curriculum and create franchises? There was a, a day, there was a moment in, in time where I told myself, no, that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is have enough time to really enjoy and devote myself to parenting and have the running of a school and the teaching occupy a delimited space that still allows me to really devote myself to that in a meaningful way. Um, and also to have the kind of relationships with my families and students at school that I want, as opposed to being, you know, expansion and, and entre entrepreneurial uh, oriented. Um, so that's, that's the anecdote. In terms of Leonard Peikoff's influence on me, in, in terms of parenting, he had a profound in influence on me in terms of my educational philosophy. And one of the key principles of my educational philosophy, which I learned from Leonard Peikoff, was the importance of hierarchy. It's a vast topic, hard to condense, but very briefly, it just means that when you give explanations to students, to children, you do so in a, in a manner that they can grasp fully for themselves. You don't hand them conclusions, which would just be empty abstractions to them floating in their minds. You take them through a process, step by step, of learning something so that it's completely independent knowledge for them. And that's something that shapes the whole identity of my school. <clears throat> and it shapes my identity as a parent too. When my kids ask me questions, I don't try to hand them ready-made answers. I try to give them answers that they can grasp at their own level of development. And um, my husband has a great line that he'll use sometimes if Seth asks him a question that's very, has a very complex answer that he's not quite ready to understand, he'll say, that's a really good question. How do you think you'd go about answering something like that? So he'll sort of turn it to a process orientation and to the idea that there is a there are steps sometimes necessary to coming to conclusions. They're not just gonna be handed to you on a platter. Um, so that's the principle of hierarchy is just one of the many things that I absorbed at a very young age from the influence of Leonard Peikoff's education course that impacts everything about my interaction with children, including my own children. And to, till I find the next question, do you want to say something very quick about uh, his, uh, his curriculum in, in the oh, homeschool yeah. program you managed? So that was a fascinating question to me because the premise of that question is that Leonard Peikoff gave me a curriculum for teaching, which would have been really nice and convenient <laughs> if he had. What I was given at the age of 24 when I started teaching Leonard Peikoff's daughter and the three other children in my class at that time was a room and you know a budget <laughs> and a lot of autonomy. So I look back on that experience now and think, wow, I had a lot of nerve to go in there and take over those kids' education. But I really, everything I did at that point, I drew upon the influences of of Leonard's philosophy of education course, I drew upon the influences of, of other, uh, you know, Peter Schwartz's writing class that I had had at the OGC. There were lots of formative influence, educational influences that I'd had prior to that. Um, but I really created the curriculum from scratch myself at that time. Good. So now we're moving to a category of questions that I would say the category is siblings or so the first question, how do you recommend preparing a toddler for a baby that's on the way? Um, so I told Rosie in advance of this that my questions are, I don't know if they're going to be unsatisfying or satisfying because my instinctive reaction to that question is I don't do a lot by way of preparation, by way of specific preparation for a specific situation. And I don't feel, I don't feel a pressure myself to um, anticipate how a child might react in a certain situation. And I don't feel 
a stress that if I don't prepare for that, things are going to go terribly wrong. And I'm not saying that's all in that question, but I just in general see parents kind of over preparing for particular situations. And often that can reflect a lot of, it, it can reflect anxiety on their part that they might do something wrong. And I think one of the reasons I'm able to enjoy parenting as much as I do is I don't live in fear that I'm going to do something wrong. I um, do the best I can. I'm content that I'll do things wrong all the time. Um, I'm content that I can't anticipate how my particular children are going to react in particular situations to particular <laughs> stimuli. Um, so I, uh, I kind of go with the flow a little more than that. Um, so in terms of something like preparing a child for a younger sibling, to me, the key is that you have a good relationship with your child that's the fundamental, that you have a good relationship with them and that you're able, that you have a good relationship with them and that you're very observant of them. So you, you watch their reactions of things and you try to understand how, you, how they're reacting to them. If you have a good relationship with them and you're observant of them, then when you find yourself in a situation that they're struggling with, it's easy to help them through that situation. But I think rather than trying to anticipate how they might react, I would just plan to be observant of how they react and, um, and, and be sure that I'm attentive to their needs uh, as they're going through that new life situation. Sibling related question number two, any tips for twins? Tips for twins. Um, that's a good question. My only experience with twins is at school. We've had several sets of twins, including, and we've had a set of triplets even. Um, I think my main piece of advice based on my ex very limited experience at school and the struggles that I've seen parents have is to try not to worry so much about the fact that there's inherently going to be a challenging dynamic between them. So one tends to, to maybe be a more dominant personality and the other tends to allow um, uh, that one to sort of be the leader and, and becomes the follower. Well, this parents will often uh, express a lot of stress about that fact Whereas from my perspective, it seems natural and it seems like one among the array of natural challenges that people face, this one is just twin related, but there are many that non-twins are going to have that are similar. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to a certain extent to just allow for those differences in persona personality, allow them for them to work through the struggles of those challenges and don't feel the need to engineer uh, the to engineer them out of having that challenge. That's in general, that's a mistake I see parents um, making is to try to engineer them out of challenges rather than helping them through the natural challenges of life. So that's that's the best I can do. It's and it's almost you almost hinted to the answer to the next question, which is how to help sing siblings to embrace to embrace each other's individuality. Mm. Uh, I wish I could ask for follow up questions because these are so abstract. Um, so I I assume it means something like. Uh, how they're more individuals than, you know, a team always stuck together at school. They're mm -hmm. like that. Uh -huh. I'm trying to think with my own children, how that would come up. So um, embrace each other's individualities. Uh, I mean, one thing is just not to have the same expectations. Sometimes it's, it's useful to have many children. It's not required. <laughs> <laughs> the more you have, the less in control of outcomes you feel like you are because they really do have such different personalities and um, unique interests. And so, uh, you know, they're going to, 
they're going to embrace each other's individuality if you as their role model and you know leader in the family are embracing their individuality. So if you're not setting uh, uniform expectations for them and you're enc encouraging the expression of their distinct personalities, and um, I think that's gonna go a long way. Good. Before we go to the next uh, question, a reminder to people, today there's no clubhouse because the episode is going to be slightly longer and then we have the Yaron Debates Europe episode. So if you want to ask questions, don't uh, wait for clubhouse. If you're a member, put it to the members group or send us a super chat. Okay, next question. Uh, the person who is asking this question introduces it as, I know that this is going to be a cliche, but... Okay. Do you introduce your the, your children to when do you introduce children to objectivism? Do mm -hmm. you let them discover philosophy by themselves, or do you help along? If so, how? Well, and maybe share, share also your experience with your children. Sure. Yeah. So I have a 22 year old and a 20 year old, and then I have a nine and six year old. So the nine and six year old have never heard of Ayn Rand, or you know they have no awareness of anything like objectivism. With the, um, with the 22 year old and the 20 year old, they, I mean, it's hard to, in a sense, they're getting an exposure to my own philosophic influences all the time in the nature of our conversations that, that we have. Um, but in terms of a direct exposure to the work of Ayn Rand, which I think had such an important and, uh, and valuable impact on me, well, how did I discover it? I read The Fountainhead when I was 14. So my, um, with the two of them, I encouraged them to read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged uh, when they're teenagers. And they've both done that in the context of their very vast um, experience of reading classics at their great books college. And uh, beyond that, I, I allow them to take the reins and decide how much they want to explore and uh, whether they want to read more. Good. Let's see if we have a super chat from Grant. Thank you for a fantastic response to Grant's question. Now I'm asking the question <laughs> anonymously so that people don't feel okay. the... <laughs> but whichever question was that grant was uh, happy with the answer so we're good <laughs> next question how oh sorry okay this is a question from the other point from the opposite let's say uh, uh, side what if my parents or parental figures are acting like toddlers so you're a child you've grown up and now you have to <laughs> Manage your now parents? Your parents were acting like toddlers. Wait, so I'm giving parenting advice for parenting your parents? That's the... Okay. Um, I'm going to really, <laughs> since that's an also very abstract question, I'm going to give step back and give a very abstract answer. Um, everybody needs to read Haim Ganot. H-A-I-M-G-I-N-O-T-T. -T. Haim Ganot. Between parent and child is the is what I consider my parenting Bible. When people ask me, do you have any books of parenting to recommend? I say, yes, one. And that's the only one I ever recommend. But it's the value of it goes way beyond relationships with between you as a parent and your children. It could definitely be valuable for you as a parent with your parents um, and also just human relationships in general. Um, and the main thing, I mean, you need to read Haim Ganat. He, he has this incredibly humane approach to human to human relationships. Just he's so like there's such a, a, a premise of of respect and um, and you know valuing and and appreciating. I don't even know how to how to begin. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop that line of thought. So the main thing you get from Haim Ganat is that when somebody is in the midst of an emotional response, there's no possibility of meaningful communication with them. That when somebody is experiencing strong emotions, um, their rational brain is not accessible. And 
one of the most important things you learn from Heimgenot is how to be patient through the experience of an emotional reaction, which can have so many subconscious sources that we're not even aware of, and then wait for the opportunity to discuss something in a respectful and, uh, and rational manner. Um, there's a lot more obviously to be gained from him than that, but that's one of the central principles that I take away from it. So I, I feel like a lot of the conflicts that parents have with their children and the parents that people have with their parents have to do with dealing with some, something when you're in the grips of emotion, you're not thinking about it clearly, you're not even totally conscious of what it is that you're butting heads about, and then you just sort of go at it in, in an attacking manner. Whereas if when somebody's having emotions, you just try to understand them and express understanding of them, um, then when you get to a point of calm, you can engage in a much more respectful manner. Now, obviously there are going to be people who are inaccessible even to that method. And there are times that you have to decide a respectful and rational relationship isn't really possible, but probably that's the rare exception and not the rule. Okay. And I wanted to ask this question because it's many, almost everyone at some point has felt that at some point they're all sweet and you are doing the parenting to your parents. Uh, Super chat from Marilyn. Thank you so much, Marilyn. My sister and I are 11 months, I assume this is, apart. Mom compared us as in why couldn't we have each other's strengths? Not good. We worked it out and get along well now. Mm -hmm. Um, so is that asking for a comment on that? Uh, it's a comment, but if you have a comment on the comment, so yeah. in a way you're, and I've seen this with, with siblings that one that your parents are telling you, look what your brother did. He's so much better. Or my parents used to do it uh, with uh, other kids in the school. Look, that kid can play basketball, but also he's a good student. And, and the super chat, the, the comment suggested that this can put, extra pressure on the kid, especially when they're young. Yeah. When a parent does that, I feel like there's some sort of self-esteem issue for them. For the stake. parent, you mean? For the parent at stake. And I think when there's a self-esteem issue for the parent at stake, that creates a combative relationship with their child. Because like I said before, I see my role as a parent, I'm going to try to, to make this as simple as I can. I try to be an exceptional role model for my, for my children. I think that's the number, probably the number one way you parent them. You set a good example for them. You act as you model the right way to interact with other human beings. You model having um, ambition and interests yourself. You model being a thoughtful and rational and um, uh, clear thinking person. You model all these things for them on a moment by moment, daily basis, not consciously, just work on yourself first. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most important thing. Be the sort of person that you want your children to be. And then that's, a, um, that's instruction that they're receiving in subtle and complex ways all day, every day without your even being conscious of it. And because it's that's part of the reason I think I say that I don't have a very conscious uh, parenting philosophy. It is important, of course, to have some principles that guide you, but also it's important that you yourself are just modeling the way you, you want them, the sort of person you want them to be on a daily basis. Um, so being a good role model for them and then Wanting, I think a lot of people would be more effective parents if they focused on wanting a relationship with their children and not an outcome from their children. That might be one of the keys to a successful and healthy and happy parenting relationship. Look for a ex parenting experience. Desire a certain relationship from them, not a certain outcome from them. So the parent that's comparing you to the kid who can play basketball and is a good student is saying, I need you to be the kind of kid. Well, <laughs> I don't need my kids to be anything except honest, responsible, kind people. That's what I want from them in terms of the 
their ambitions and what kind of life they want to live and what kind of career they have and what their personal interests are. I'm excited to just watch them and help them to develop those um, as they as uh, as they discover and find them. Uh, there's not a particular outcome that I'm seeking from them aside from you know good moral character and a happy relationship with me. Um, so so that's what I think of when I think of somebody comparing siblings or comparing you to uh, the sort of the sort of child that they imagine you to be is. They're looking for a certain outcome and for some reason, their sense of self-esteem is dependent on that and that's why it matters so much to them. Let me do then a follow-up, which is also in a way the follow-up to the, to the very first question about a child reaching its potential. What if though the fact that your parents never... So I think this was the case in my upbringing. I always thought in retrospect and after 20 years, if they had pushed me more, I mm -hmm. would have excelled more in class and definitely more in sports. So I would have been way more competitive. So obviously it's my mistake at the end of the day, but I'm thinking, what if I had a bit more authoritative parents where they would push me a bit more? Look, you, you, you need to train harder. You cannot be good at basketball by just doing the what everyone else does. You need to try more. So, and when we hear about great athletes, isn't there always or usually a story of someone who, pushed you this authority a bit authoritarian figure like the teacher in whiplash okay that's yeah. an archetype yeah. but something like that so maybe pushing a bit more could help the child reach its potential um i'm glad you brought up whiplash because that was the first thing i thought of it's funny because i loved that movie and people often were horrified to learn that i loved it because they said how could you as an educator like that movie when that teacher is such a monster. And my response always was that the teacher had nothing to do with it. I mean, the teacher was, a, was okay, his, his, yes, his techniques were, were borderline abusive, but the thing is the kid was seeking that out. So I thought that's what he wanted. That's what he desired. He wanted to be the best and he needed somebody who was going to abusively push him to, I always thought of that character of the teacher as the kid's own internal drive manifested as an out, an outward human being so that there could be this plot situation created. But really I saw that as the personification in a character of this intense internal drive to be the greatest. And so it's, it's convenient that you bring that up because I, again, I'm speaking from my experience. Obviously there must be many situations where you know, athlete Tiger Woods' dad, I, I think of as this you know, big, big figure in his life who really pushed him to success. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't know if the formula there is that the pushing is really what was effective or it was just the pushing combined with the child's own discovery of an internal drive and discovery of a passion, something that they really wanted to be successful at. I don't know. All I know is that that's not the kind of relationship I want with my kids. I don't, I don't want to push them into things. I haven't seen it be successful in my relationships with them. And what I want to do is be somebody who observes and celebrates their accomplishments. I want them to feel very visible and very noticed for the things they do. And I want them to feel encouraged when they discover something that they want to pursue. So that's my own approach to um, it, not, not to push, just to observe, encourage, and facilitate. Okay, so I think this is a good point to pause for tonight and we're gonna be back tomorrow, but I want to finish with this beautiful comment which again shows the appreciation that the community has for you, uh, mm -hmm. Lisa. So super chat from Michael. Thank you for everything you do. You are an inspiration and I learned so much just by being witness to your day to 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 your day to day at least as much as you share on social media. So thanks uh, Michael, thank you Lisa. Uh, I share uh, everyone's uh, appreciation uh, for you and and again my my inspiration based on your work is mostly in appreciating literature because I can't you know I, I I'm ne nowhere near being a parent but I can understand what people say that things that you have to say about something, you drag people into that and they they see it through the passionate way that you see it. So 
uh, it's, it's great that we have you here. And tomorrow is going to be part two. We have many questions that we didn't address. Members, feel free to send more questions if you think of good questions on WhatsApp. The rest of our friends, you can send us super chats tomorrow during the episode. Now, in 20 minutes, we have Yaron Debates Europe. Today, Yaron is going to discuss with the leader of the Scottish Libertarian Party. And predictably, the topic is libertarianism, good or bad. And with that, let me see if Razi has anything else. Oh, one more. Mm -hmm. uh, Two more appreciative super chats, so I have to read them and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, read with me is a top 10 value for me. By the way, people, read with me is that app that Lisa has created where you read the book and chapter by chapter, Lisa gives commentary. So Daniel says, read with me is a top 10 value for me. Thanks, Lisa. Question, your mm -hmm. thoughts on the current state of public high school curriculum in California? Okay, that opens a can of worms, but... What's your quick reply to that? Uh, stay away at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, both of my, I mean, obviously there's a, that is an extraordinarily complex question. I will tell you that both of my children opted, they went to private school briefly and then they tested out of high school early and uh, took something called the California High School Proficiency Exam and then went straight on to community college and bypassed the experience. I wish they could have had a normal high school experience, but that seemed to work out better for them. Good. And Marilyn says it depends. So this was a question about the, the sisters. It didn't get, I didn't get along with my mother. Had she pushed more, I might have done less. Mm. And actually that's, that's what I thought when Lisa gave her answer that maybe I'm a bit unfair. It's not that, because whenever someone pushed me, yeah, I was lazy. I didn't like being pushed. So that's... that's yeah, and if answer. I can just say to that, I want to go back to my relationships point because I don't know what your relationship with your parents was, but I have a very good, very amicable, very... Um, I, asked, I asked both of my daughters, my 20 and 22-year-olds, um, prior to the show, I said, uh, okay, I'm going to go on and talk about parenting. What do you think is my essence as a parent? Just answer that right now on the spot. And my daughter, Greta, who's 20, said, you trusted us um, and trusted us to make our own decisions. And I think that's the not push. You didn't push us. You didn't, you know, try to overly micromanage our lives. You didn't try to engineer things. You trusted us to figure things out. And Lana, my 22 year old said, um, yeah, you always treat your kids with respect. Um, so, you know, that's boiling down the whole of 22 and 20 years of parenting into one word. But I think what it reflects is that I have a really good relationship with them. I have shown trust in and respect for them. They have a lot of trust in and respect for me. And what that means is pushing is not necessary. I might, not they might come to me for advice. Had you been in a position where you could come to your parent, you wanted to come to your parents for advice and say, should I work harder at this thing and, you know, really dedicate, then they might have been able to have that influence on you. But if they just pushed against your will, yeah, it probably wouldn't have been effective. Makes sense. Okay. For more greater insights tomorrow, same time, uh, part in the Q&A with Lisa, part two. Lisa, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for being with us. Bye-bye. My pleasure.